I want to talk to you today on this theme, life-changing prayers. Tim already mentioned that Friday evening between 7 and, wait, wait a minute, now I've forgotten the times. Pardon me? Thank you. 6.30 and 7.30. Friday evening, between 6.30 and 7.30, we're going to gather on Zoom last time this year in January. I hope we're going to be in person to pray. But last time on Zoom, we're going to gather for prayer. Now, I know you've got lots of things going on. It's a busy, hectic time of year. But please don't neglect the opportunity to pray together. It's such an important thing. I want to say it's more important than anything else that we're going to do at this time of year. So join us, if you will, uh, Friday evening. And I want to talk to you on that theme of prayer today. Lord, we pray for your help right now. May your words come to life for us. God, I pray that you'd hide me behind the cross of Christ that the Holy Spirit may have his way in our hearts, in our homes today. Amen. To pray is to engage with the creator of the universe, the one who spoke the world into existence out of nothing. To pray is to engage with him. It's like plugging your expended battery into a power source to refuel, to refill. How many of you own a, a smartphone or any kind of electronic device really that needs to be recharged from time to time? When I got my first iPhone, it came with a little tiny white plug like this, and I could plug it in and it would charge my phone. When I got my first iPad, that little plug was insufficient. If I tried to charge my iPad with the plug that came with my phone, it would go all day and all night and still wasn't charged because the little socket that they gave me with the iPhone was, excuse me, was different than the one that came with the iPad. It's really simple electronics. I know nothing about it, which is why it's so simple. One amp or five watts is what it takes to charge a phone, but two amps or 12 or 15 watts is what it takes to charge an iPad. So it's like doubling up your power. And I thought of that as I was thinking about plugging into the source of divine energy, grace, and purpose through prayer. We need all the power we can get. So how you pray makes a real difference as to how much power is conveyed. If you're praying five-watt prayers, but you're needing 12-watt faith, it's going to take you a long time. You see what I'm saying? So today we're going to consider together Paul's four life-changing prayers from the scriptures. But before we do, I want us to talk about a few generalities. Many of our prayers are prompted by personal needs, obvious things like food, shelter, sickness, or emotional needs like comfort, courage, peace, joy. And we can ask for all these things. And God has told us that he can and will give us those things because God cares about us and he understands our weakness and our needs. And he's a provider. That's one of his names, the God who sees and provides. As Paul affirmed, this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. The same God will supply all your needs. However, God is not like the fabled genie in the bottle. 
He doesn't just pop up to grant our wishes. Paul was confident that God would meet the Philippians' need when he said, my God will supply all your need. He was confident of this because he had experienced that God would provide his needs. And here's the key. God provided all of Paul's needs in the course of Paul's service in the gospel. So what he was saying my God shall supply all your needs. He was saying that he would supply your needs as you are engaged in the work of the gospel. But to think that God would supply all your needs while you're ignoring what he wants you to do is sheer foolishness. We'll call it the condition of our confidence. God will meet our needs too so that we may do his will, not our own. Does that make sense? Yes. Or as Andrew Murray put it, God is ready to assume full responsibility for the life wholly yielded to him. If you give it all to Jesus, if you really do, then he will take it all and carry you. These prayers of the apostles are prayers for God's people. They're prayers for fellow believers. While he most certainly prayed for non-believers to be saved, especially his fellow Jews, Paul's prayers are aimed at the needs of people in the church. And this example should be instructive for us. Since it takes a Christian to make a Christian, that is, it takes a believer to proclaim life-giving truth, the message of the gospel, the good news about Jesus, Paul concentrated on praying for his fellow believers. Because if they weren't healthy, then the gospel would not be effective. Just as the first aim of your faith in Christ should be to love your fellow believers, without which your claim to love God would be invalid, so also the first aim of your prayers should be the spiritual well-being of our brothers and sisters in Christ here and around the world. Make the church healthy, and the world will be blessed. I'm going to say that again, because I didn't get one amen. Make the church healthy, and the world will be blessed. Now, as to the format of Paul's prayers, we're going to see that his requests were simple, and they were straightforward. They weren't lengthy. The passages I'm going to share with you are fairly brief, just a few verses. But what he did express at length in his prayers were the outcomes for which he aimed, the answers to the needs for which he hoped to have God's ear. We need to learn to pray with the end in mind. What changes do you hope to see? And right here is where our own understanding of the will of God has great bearing. What outcome is God working toward? If we don't know, the best thing is to spend some time finding out that first. What outcome are you aiming? What are you up to? What are you trying to do? How are you working in this life, in this home, in this relationship, in this situation, in this nation? What are you up to, God? If we're not praying for the same result God is working toward, should he pay attention to us? Should he stop what he's doing to listen to our chatter? Here's what the Apostle John wrote about this. He said, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, he said, we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. We are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. We will receive from him, he said, 
whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things that please him. Did you pick it up? Things that please him in both of those verses. Things that please him. How many accumulated hours I have spent asking God for the things that would please me. I can't begin to number. But the effective prayers I have prayed have been those I have prayed concerning what pleases him. Praying from human need doesn't stimulate or require human faith doesn't require any faith. To pray from need, everybody sees needs. Everybody feels needs. Everyone's aware of needs. Where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing from God what he wants to do. Faith comes from hearing what God has said or is saying. And then we can align our requests with his plans and we can pray with confidence. I know that it's natural to be moved by need or pain or grief, but be careful. Recognizing common human needs is no sign of faith or spirituality. Every sinner feels such things, thinks about such things. But the scripture says without faith, it's impossible to please God. You know, the world outside of the church does a lot of praying. You realize that? The world outside the church, people who don't know Jesus Christ, do a lot of praying. I'm sure you've heard the story uh, or the, the line about the man in the foxhole. There's always a man of prayer, right? Everybody prays when they're in trouble. Everybody prays when they're desperate. Even people who are atheists will be inclined to call on God just in case there is one. So need may move you, but you, beloved, should pray from faith, not from need. You should pray from faith, not from need. I'll say more about that in a moment. Let's see how Paul did. Okay? First passage we're going to come to is Ephesians chapter 1. Paul said, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, here's what he's praying for, may give you spiritual wisdom and revelation in your growing knowledge of him. Since the eyes of your heart have been enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the incomparable greatness of his power toward us who believe. Now, in this long paragraph, if you will, that highlighted portion in gold is the prayer. That's the prayer. May God give you spiritual wisdom and revelation in your growing knowledge of him. That's what he prayed for. God give you spiritual, that is from the Holy Spirit, wisdom and revelation. We need wisdom and revelation from the Spirit to see things that we can't see with our natural eyes, to hear things that we can't hear with our natural ears, to understand things that we cannot know with our natural thought processes. Holy Spirit, illuminate us. Paul was praying that they would receive spiritual wisdom and revelation to know Christ more. Listen, I'm going to just drop a little bomb here. You really don't need spiritual wisdom and revelation to know who the Antichrist is. You don't. You don't need it. It's not going to change anything if you knew it. 
what you need is to know Christ more. You think you know him, but you don't know him as you should. I've been studying his word for over four decades. I don't know the first bit about him. I don't know him as I should. I fully understand what Paul meant when he said at the end of his life, that incredible life, that I may know him. He hungered and thirsted to know Christ more. And it prompted him to pray for all the Christians he knew in the same vein. But look at this. He wants them to have spiritual wisdom and revelation and the growing knowledge of Christ so that we're going to see those two words again and again today. So that. And those indicate to us that the request of his prayer has a further effect. It has another impact in their lives. I want you to have spiritual wisdom and revelation, but not just so that you can say, oh, I know so much. <laughs> right? I want you to have spiritual wisdom and revelation so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the incomparable greatness of his power towards us who believe. The prayer for spiritual wisdom and revelation, or wisdom and revelation from the Spirit, has three focal points of impact, three repercussions in our lives, three effects on our future, that we might know the hope of the calling that Christ has given us. And don't think of calling as some official position to which he is calling you. Let's start at the beginning. He called them to be with him. What? That sounds so simple and sure. We'll hang out together. Try it. It's not as easy as you might think. Second to that, the hope of his calling, calling you to be with him, leads to a hope that cannot be undone. It leads to a hope that is full of glory. It leads to a hope that is sure and steadfast. It leads to a hope that will carry you through whatever kind of difficulty you may face, whatever kind of loss you may suffer. The hope of his calling, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The hope of his calling is powerful. So that you may know the wealth of his glorious inheritance. Christ has an inheritance. He's the Son, God. And the Father has prepared for him an inheritance. And strange as it may seem, his inheritance is us. He's inheriting us, a bride, a people, a kingdom of priests, a new heaven and a new earth for a new people. Glorious, that's what he calls it, a glorious inheritance. Why do I need to know the wealth of that? It's not my inheritance. No, but you're part of the inheritance. You need to know the wealth of this glorious inheritance so that you can fully play your part in it. So that Christ will not hang his head in disappointment when you step up before him. But instead, he'll open his arms and smile wide. Because God has given you spiritual wisdom and revelation so that you may know the wealth of his glorious inheritance. It's not just about the relationship. 
It's about all that God has planned for us to do with him throughout what we call eternity. Because you're not gonna, you're not gonna go to heaven to sit back on a recliner cloud and play a harp. You're going to rest like never before, but not in that way. It's not your body that's going to rest. It's your spirit that will rest in the power and the energy of God. Even while you're working with all the energy he gives you, your heart will be at rest. And friends, honestly, you can actually begin to experience that here. And if you find yourself laboring for the Lord and it's just wearing you out, you need to step back and find the place of rest with him and then re-engage the work for him. But that is a sermon for another day. God give you spiritual wisdom and revelation so that you may know him so that you may know the hope of his calling, so that you may know the wealth of his glorious inheritance, and so that you may know the incomparable greatness of his power. I need to know hope for the future. I need to know the glory of that future, and I need the power to pursue it. How do I get that? By praying, as Paul prayed for us, God give you spiritual wisdom and revelation so that you may know these things. The incomparable greatness of his power towards us who believe. That power is measured by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. From death. No breath. No brain activity. No pulse. Dead gray matter, <laughs> alive. The incomparable power that raised Christ from the dead and, and seated him at the right hand of the majesty on high, crowned with endless crowns, king of kings and lord of lords. That power, that power, is the incomparable power that God pours into our lives. Maybe just a trickle for now, but it's the same power. Next passage, Ephesians chapter 3. I pray that according to the wealth of his glory, Father, may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit, in the inner person, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, so that because you have been rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and thus to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Look at the passage on the screen, because again, I've highlighted the sum of the prayer. It's what? It's 11 words. That's it. Some of you are worried. If I try to pray, it's just going to take so long. I'm worried. Some of you do take so long. 11 words. I pray that you will be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner person. That's the prayer. Why did he pray that? What was he shooting for? What was the outcome he anticipated? Look at it again. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So that you'll be able to comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ. So that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There are three so that's in this prayer. There are three objectives that Paul had. Three things that were calling forth the prayer of faith from his heart and from his lips. Three things he was after for the people of God. Number one, 
so that by faith Christ may dwell in your hearts. Listen, Christ needs to dwell in your heart. It's not enough to have Christ in a book on your shelf. It's not enough to have Christ at the church when you visit. It's not enough to have Christ in the world around us. You need Christ in your heart. And Paul so earnestly prayed that God would strengthen us with power in the inner man, within, through the Spirit, so that Christ would dwell in our hearts. Second, so that is, as you're rooted and grounded in the love of Christ, you may be able to comprehend the love of Christ, its breadth, its length, its height, its depth. I'm exhausted just thinking about all those four directions. The breadth of the love of Christ. I mean, how many people can it take now? Just us? More than us? All the churches in the county? All the county? The state? The nation? Multiple nations? What about multiple generations? Ages? What about heaven as well as earth? The breadth of the love of Christ. Many Christians have an extremely narrow view of the love of Christ. I'm not going to expound on it. I'm just going to say it. I'm going to drop it right there. A narrow view. Christ only loves these certain kinds of people. Now, I, I can't tell you all the kinds of people he loves or all the kinds he doesn't love. I'm just reminding you that his love is broader than we think. Well, it's not only broad, it's long. Well, I've only got four decades to record, but it's at least four decades long because he hasn't quit on me yet. He hasn't given up on me yet. How about you? How long will Jesus love you? Longer than you can count. What about the height of his love? The height. I'm talking about where does his love take you? All the way to heaven? Or just to the pearly gate? And then it's on you. <laughs> the height of the love of Christ for you. And the depth of the love of Christ for you. Corey Tenboom said, no matter how deep you fallen, the hand of God reaches deeper still. Whatever has been the deepest and darkest part of your life, it's not beyond his reach. His love will find you right there and grip you and bring you out to the highest height. And he'll hold you as long as it takes. You need to know the love of Christ this way. So Paul prayed, God strengthen you with power within through the Spirit so that you may know the breadth, the length, the height, the depth of his love. And third, so that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. Because this isn't just about knowledge inside your brain. This is about you experiencing the fullness, the fullness of God so that you may be filled up. I don't know what your capacity is. Everybody has a different capacity, and your capacity changes over time. Sometimes it shrinks, sometimes it increases, according to how we allow the Holy Spirit to work with us. But I will tell you this. The things that we often count as the most difficult and most undesirable parts of our life are often the very things that are actually stretching and increasing our capacity. And just like a balloon, well, I can blow it up to six inches and it's full of air. 
but I can blow it up to 12 inches and it's more full of air. And I can blow it up to 20 inches and it's full of air, but more. And your capacity for the Spirit's work in your life can increase like that through time, through application of your faith. And God will fill you more. As your capacity increases, he'll fill you more. He'll fill you more. He'll fill you again. Paul prayed that for the people of God. Strengthened with power within through the Spirit so that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. That's a lot of fullness, by the way, because the heaven of heavens and all the earth and the universe that we think we know about is not enough to contain him. God dwells outside of the created world, as well as inside it. But I mean, he's not limited by its limit. The fullness of God. See, I think it's, here's the problem with the balloon illustration, is that it has a limit, and that's it. And after that, but think about a riverbed instead. A riverbed that's full from side to side. Is that the limit of the water? Oh, no, it's not, is it? Because all that water has a current. It's flowing through through the riverbed. So what is the measure of the water that a riverbed can contain? No one knows because it constantly flows. And that's the way, the only way that you or I can be filled with all the fullness of God is when it is open-ended and continually flowing through our hearts and lives. Third prayer is from Philippians chapter number one. I thank my God, he said, in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. This is a prayer of thanksgiving. This is a prayer of thanksgiving because these people, the Philippian church, were participating in the gospel, supporting Paul, doing the same work as Paul. It just, it was so good. It was so encouraging to him. It was such a joy to his heart. He said, every time I think of you, my heart overflows with thanks. This is such a good thing. Sometimes I feel that way about you. Just such a good thing. God is doing it. When we work together, when we move together, when we worship together, it's such a good thing. I thank my God in all my remembrance. And I pray this, that your love may abound. That's another, so that. So he's giving thanks to God with an end in mind so that your love may abound in knowledge and every kind of insight, so that you decide what is best. You're sincere and blameless and filled with the fruit of righteousness. We joyfully thank God for these people because they are fellow believers. I thank God for you that you believe in Jesus Christ. You know, in any local church, the faith level of the people that make up the church varies a lot. Because the more faith we have, the more new people we'll have. And the more new people we'll have, the more people will have just a little bit of faith. And so it never is the situation where all of us have graduated and we're in the upper levels of faith. No, it, it should never be. If it is, we've got a closed, broken, and dying system. 
the system always should have wide open doors, entry points for people all over the place where they can come into faith in Jesus Christ because Dan brings them or Marisol brings them or Steve invites them or Netta brings them along. Everybody gets to bring people in and then their faith is new, but their faith begins to grow. And we're all growing in the faith. I thank you, I thank God for you because we're fellow believers. And I'm praying this way so that your love may abound. So that your love may abound in knowledge and in insight. I want you to get it. But this is what he's called us to. My command is this, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's his commandment. That's why we're here. This, the local church, not just this room or just this time period, but this, the local church, is the school of divine love. This is where we get to learn and practice his love. His commandment is to love one another, your fellow believers, as he has loved you. So Paul prays, so that your love may abound in knowledge and insight. We need both knowledge and insight to know how to love one another. If you think you know how naturally, you don't. You're wrong. You're looking in the wrong direction. This is God's love. This isn't human love. This isn't the milk of human kindness. This is supernatural love, the kind of love that brought Christ out of heaven's throne, down to the earth as an infant, living through all of the backlash of humanity, the suffering of people around him, until finally he was slain by them. That kind of love. I know talking about his death doesn't really excite you. It doesn't say, oh, yeah, I want to be there. But actually you do. Because the Spirit wants to work in you what he worked in Jesus so that his love would carry him wherever the Father wanted him to go. For that, we need knowledge and we need insight. And then he prayed also so that you can make good decisions. Now, this isn't just a decision about buying a home or a car or a, a business decision. These are decisions about living for Christ, decisions about doing what's right, decisions about how to love your neighbor or your enemy. Sometimes it might be the same person so that you may make good decisions and be sincere and without blame, so that you can be filled with the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of righteousness, not just filled with righteousness, but filled with its fruit, filled with what it produces, because righteousness is not just a way you do things. It produces something in your life and through your life that brings glory and praise to God. The fourth one, I need to move quickly here from Colossians. Paul said, I ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may live worthily of the Lord and please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good deed, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the display of all patience and steadfastness joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. You see the prayer? Right in the first sentence. I pray that God will fill you with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Remember that the word spiritual here isn't talking about spiritual as opposed to carnal merely, but it, it's a word that means from the Spirit. It literally means given by the Spirit. So I want you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will as the Spirit gives you wisdom and understanding of that. 
Too many people, frankly, too many pastors think they know the will of God. And so they set it down on paper or they proclaim it from a pulpit and they put a period at the end and say, that's it, that's the will of God. Well, that might be the will of God today, but then tomorrow it will come. You think you know the will of God? You think you've done the will of God? I hope you have done the will of God. But that was then. This is now. And sufficient for the day, Jesus said, is the trouble thereof, which means you're going to have to figure out his will again today. What does he want from you now? Right? So Paul prayed, God, fill you with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual, from the spirit, wisdom and understanding. Why? So that you may live worthily of the Lord and please him. Please him. Back to that again. So that you may live worthily of the Lord. This does not say so that you may be worthy. It means so that you may live in a manner that is worthy. I, this is not in my notes, but I'm going to interject this. Because I something really stirred me up this week that I was listening to. And it talked about uh, how worthy we are in Christ, and that we should declare ourselves worthy in the Lord. I'm sorry. I don't, I can't go with that. I can't, I can't do that. I can't say, oh God, I'm worthy. <laughs> Look at me. I'm worthy. You made me worthy. But see how worthy I am? You made me, you know, credit to you, but look, <laughs> I can't do that. I can't do that. I'm just telling you. I'm telling you, I know myself too well. I know myself too deeply. I've known myself for too long. I am not worthy. And if I wasn't worthy at the beginning, I won't be worthy at the end. Not me, myself, and I. My worth doesn't change. What, what do you think? The things I've done, the things I said, the things I disbelieved and disobeyed somehow vanish? And now it's all. No, that's my history. That's the reality of who I am. That's my life. And I am so grateful to God that he redeems all of my life, that he takes all my disobedience, all my foolishness, and he redeems it, and he makes it somehow useful and good in my future. But it doesn't make me worthy. It makes him worthy of praise. And I want to live my life in a worthy manner today, not like I did in the past, unworthily. But it's the manner of my life. It's not my personal worth. It's the manner of my life. I want to, that's why the call to salvation is a call to change your life. Not just to change your thinking about yourself. This isn't new age change your mind, change your life, change your world. No, this has got to be a real transformation by the power of the spirit of resurrection, or we're done, we're sunk. We may as well cash it in right now. Go eat, be merry, because tomorrow we're going to die. That's it. Or it's what he said. So Paul prayed that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will, in spiritual wisdom and understanding so that they may live in a manner, so that we may live in a manner that is worthy of the Lord, meaning it pleases him. I want to live to please him today and tomorrow. And what does it mean exactly? He says it right here. To please him, bearing fruit in every good deed, growing in the knowledge of God. Still need that. Strengthen with all power for the display of all patience and steadfastness. Oh, I don't like that one too much, but it's good. Strengthen with all power for the display of all patience and steadfastness. You know, there's another kind of power that we worship in this world today, and it's not the power to be patient and steadfast. 
It's the power to get ahead. Be first. Get to the light first. Get off the, you know, get off the starting block first. Always first. That's not the way he calls it, though. So we're going to need the Spirit's help here. We are going to need the power of God and the knowledge of his will so that we can grow in his knowledge even more, be strengthened for the display of patience and steadiness, and joyfully give our thanks to the Lord in the course of that. Now, my question is, do you want to pray life-changing prayers? These four prayers have been recorded in Holy Scripture. These are God-breathed, God-inspired prayers. They're not of human origin. They're of divine origin, prayed by a man who knew the Lord and understood what God wanted from him. And they're given to us so that we can learn how to pray similarly life-changing prayers. So let's follow Paul's example. Number one, we need to be sensitive to needs, but pray from faith, not the sense of, oh, God, this is awful. We're in deep trouble here. That really doesn't, that doesn't move the heart of God. You know, for one thing, you're only one seven and a half billionth of the trouble that's going on today. It's not very impressive to anyone else. <laughs> Be sensitive to the needs, though, but be sure you're praying from faith. Get to know the will of God from his word so that you can ask God to do what God wants to do, what will please God in the present situation. And friends, I'm just going to say to you, I would rather for myself and for you, I would rather you were silent until you could Pray in faith, because all that blathering only distracts you and keeps you, and maybe others too, and keeps you from finding the faith you need. Wait on the Lord until you know what the Lord wants, and then pray for that. I mean, aim precisely. Don't just try to hit the wall, hit the bullseye. That's what Paul did. Those were those highlighted passages. Targeted prayer. You can only pray targeted prayers if you wait to find out what pleases God, what he wants. Be sensitive to the needs, but pray from faith. Number two, pray with the end in mind. That is the outcome that God wants. No matter how distant it may seem or how long it may take, be clear about the objectives of your prayer. So, like he was praying, I want you to live a life that's worthy of the Lord and pleases him. That's my objective, so that you can bear fruit and good deeds and grow in the knowledge of God and be strengthened with all power and show, display patience and steadfastness and joyful thanksgiving. These are my objectives. What do we need to accomplish those objectives? God fill you with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's how it works. Number three, be succinct and ask boldly. And by the way, if you're not succinct, you will not be able to ask boldly because you'll be wandering all over the place trying to find the right words to say it. And well, that didn't sound quite right. Let me try this. And you'll be going all over the place. There's no boldness in that. Again, I'm, gonna, I'm urging you, stop before you start talking. Listen. To the Holy Spirit. What is it you're up to? What do you want to accomplish? How do you want these people, these relationships, these circumstances to change? Not how I want it to change. How do you want? What are you doing? I want to pray for you to accomplish what you want. Be succinct and ask boldly and forth. Always thank and praise God for his faithful mercies. Now, before we're done here, we've got seven minutes. We're going to do a little exercise of prayer. 
life-changing prayer together. Are you ready? Ready or not, here we go. Number one, is there a brother or sister in Christ for whom you could pray right now? I want you to take 10 seconds, I'm going to count them, to choose one person and whisper their name to God. Now, I want you to take 10 more seconds to identify one thing, just one, that God wants for them. You may feel a, a dozen, choose one, that God wants for them, that God wants for them, with which you will agree in faith. You might select from these four prayers of Paul that we just looked at. Maybe they need spiritual wisdom and revelation of the Lord. Maybe they need inner strength and power through the Spirit. Maybe they need to give thanks for their fellowship in the work of the gospel. Maybe they need to be filled with the knowledge of God's will or perhaps something else. 10 seconds. You've got the name. Figure out what you're going to pray. Okay. Finally, 10 more seconds to identify why do they need that particular grace? Why do they need that grace? It, this is your so that. Your prayer should always have a so that. I'm asking for this so that this outcome will happen. So take 10 seconds right now to identify why this person needs that particular grace. Here we go. That's it. 30 seconds to prepare ourselves to pray for someone that means something to us and to God. Now, whisper your prayer to God for them and for the outcome that he wants, that you're trusting him for today. Remember, this is not based on their need. It's based on your faith in what God is willing to do for them. Whisper your prayer to him. Take a few seconds right now. Now, let's all say amen and give God thanks for hearing us today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for hearing us today. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you that you are working through your church everywhere it exists. And thank you, God, that you're working through our prayers even where the church does not.